Hello everybody, welcome back to BiblicalCulture.org. Today we will be looking at the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, BHS for short, the most important single volume Hebrew Bible out there today. And this is number two in a two-part series. In the first part, we looked at the scholarly apparatus of the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, and what we saw is that there are many different versions of biblical texts in manuscripts such as the Septuagint, the Vulgate, the Samaritan Pentateuch, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and so on and so forth. And in order to see those different versions, we look at the scholarly apparatus. So that was the first video, and you do not have to have seen the first video for what we're going to be doing today. Today we're going to be looking at the Mesorah notes, which are all over each page of the BHS. And in order to talk about the Mesorah notes, we're going to have to talk about three things. The first is textual instability, and that basically means that when Whenever a scribe copies a long text, there are going to be differences between the original text and the scribe's copy. It's just how it goes. Mistakes creep in. And then we're going to speak about the Masoretes. The Masoretes were a group of people who came about to stop those mistakes. They were all about quality control. They wanted to stabilize the text that was their goal. And then finally, with this background information, we'll be able to look at three different types of Masoretic notes in the BHS. Masoretic basically means notes of those Masoretes. And there are three different types of these notes in the BHS. So let's get started. Let's begin with textual instability. What we're looking at here is a scribe copying Megillat Esther, the scroll of Esther. And the scribe's job is to copy everything that he sees here in this book of Esther into here, this scroll of Esther. And his goal is to make no mistakes. And the truth is that scribes such as this one are very good at what they do. And the greatest proof for this is the great Isaiah scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls, more than 2,000 years old. And for all intents and purposes, this scroll is identical to the book of Isaiah you are going to see in your Bibles today. That said, it is almost identical, it is not completely identical, and indeed there are many variants, hundreds of little variants, a letter here, a letter there, and these creep in no matter what. And right here we're looking at a passage in the Great Isaiah Scroll, and we can see there are some dots above some words, and what that means is that you must delete these words. This word was written accidentally. In other cases we have words above words saying that you should insert this word here, it was accidentally omitted. And then we have something really cool here on the side where another scribe added some words that were left out. And once you know what to look for, you can actually see these things of writing on the side throughout the scroll and throughout other scrolls in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this is the problem of textual instability. When a scribe accidentally omits or adds a letter, a word, or even an entire passage. And we really know about this from the Bible itself. We didn't need the Dead Sea Scrolls to show us this. And I'll give you two examples from the book of Joshua. The first example concerns where Joshua was buried. In Joshua 24.30, we are told that he was buried in Timnat Serach. However, in Judges 2.9, we are told that he was buried in Timnat Cheres. And what happened here is that the original word, whichever one it was, was inverted so that Serach became Cheres or Cheres became Serach. And that's how this textual error crept into our text. Another example of textual instability concerns one of the cities of the tribe of Manasseh, Manasseh, that was a Levitical city. And in Joshua 21.27, we are told that that city is called Beeshterah. However, in 1 Chronicles 6.56, we are told that that same city is called Ashtarot. Now, Ashtarot makes a lot of sense. It's a well-known city in the region of Menasha, but Beshterot doesn't really make any sense because we've never seen this town before. It's never mentioned anywhere else. We've never heard of it. So what likely happened was a scribe misunderstood Ashtarot, and it became Beeshterot. The main four letters of Ashtarot became the four letters in Beeshterah. So this is the main problem of textual instability, that small errors can creep into a text. Another problem with the biblical text was that in ancient Hebrew, there were no vowel markers. So that biblical text were passed down from generation to generation without any vowels. And what we're looking at here is again the great Isaiah scroll, and there are no vowels. And what this means is that things can get very confusing very fast. Let's look here at the Hebrew root Sha'al. Sha'al. This could mean Sha'ul, Saul. It could mean Sha'ol, netherworld. It could also mean Sha'ila, a question, or Sha'al, he asked. And if you think about it, the same can be done with English. If we would take away the vowels from HLL, we don't know what the original word was. Perhaps it could have been Hel. Perhaps it was Hello. Perhaps it was Halal. 
or could have even been two words like hi Lola or hi Lily. So these are the two main problems in textual instability. The first is that letters, words, and sometimes even sentences or paragraphs could be omitted or added by mistake. And the second is that the vowels were not transmitted in the biblical text. So there were a group of people who came to rectify this and they are known as the Masoretes. The Masoretes lived in Tveria, Tiberias, on the Sea of Galilee, the Kinneret, at about the close of the Talmudic period, the 700s, the 800s, the 900s, and their name probably derives from the word misora, tradition, because they were all about keeping the tradition of the biblical text pure and alive. And they produced many different types of works, but the most important for us is the Leningrad Codex, which was written in the year 1008 CE, and it is the oldest complete Hebrew Bible, the oldest Tanakh that we have today, and it is currently housed in the National Library of Russia in St. Petersburg. So let's take a look at what's inside. Here we're looking at a single page, and if we zoom into some of the words, we'll see immediately where the masteries come into play. So we're looking at the word Vayomer, and the reason I know it's pronounced Vayomer is because there are three vowels here inserted by the masteries so that I know that it's Va, Yo, and Mer. Vayo and Mer. And then if we look at this word with the word after it, I know that these words are read Vayo Mer Elohim. And the reason I know that is because the Masoretes inserted cantillation marks so that we now know how to read the biblical text in the synagogue. And then finally, and perhaps most important, we see a little dot here, a circle, which is called a circellus. And what the circellus does is it notifies you that there's a Masoretic note on the side of the page in the Masora Katana, the small Masora. And if we look at the page, in between the margins on the side, there are small notes, and these are called the Masora Katana, the small notes, probably because most of the notes are written in shorthand, one letter, maybe two letters, very briefly stated, but a lot of information is given. And then these notes often reference the Masora Gedola, the large Masora, which is written at the top and the bottom of the page in the Leningrad Codex. And finally, there's the Masora Sofit, the final Masora, which is sometimes written at the end of a book. And all of these Masora notes were included in our text, the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, but you just need to know where to look. So let's begin. Let's take a look at one page in the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. And the main part of the page is going to be our Hebrew text, as it appears in the Leningrad Codex. And when we zoom in, we can actually see, oh, there are many vowels. So then I know that this phrase means kol sha'ar ami because there are vowels. And then also there are cantillation marks, so that I know that this phrase is koshar ami. Now, about the notes. The small misora, the misora katana, is in the margins of every page of the BHS, and these often are going to point you to the misora gedola, which is at the bottom of every page of the BHS, and not to forget that at the bottom of every page of BHS is a scholarly apparatus, which we spoke about in part one of this two-part series. And finally, at the end of books in the Biblia Hebraica Shukartensia, you are going to get a final misora, a misora sofit, which will give you some more information. So let's look at all three types of these notes, beginning with the misora katana, which means the small misora, or in Latin, the misora parva. And then when we look at a page in the margins, we're going to see the Misora Katana, the Misora Parva. And this is just like it was in the Leningrad Codex. So let's begin with page one of the Bible itself, Genesis chapter one. And I want to focus on two words at the end of verse eight, which are Yom Sheni, day two, the second day. And if you notice, there's a little circellus above and in between these two words, which means that this phrase has a Misora note. And then I look at the side and I see a Lamed. So how am I supposed to know what this Lamed means? I'm going to look at a book called The Misora of Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia by Kelly, Minat, and Crawford. It's about $10 to $20. I'll have a link in the description below. And what this book is going to do is going to have an entry for each and every one of these little Misora notes so that you'll know what the Masoretes were trying to tell you. And in our case, if we look at the Lamed, which is the most abundant Misora note, it appears way more than any other type of note. The Lamed means leta, which means none other, unique, occurs only once. And so what that means is that this phrase only occurs here in Genesis 1.8, so that if you have the phrase Yom Sheni in Jeremiah, in Habakkuk, in Ezekiel, wherever else you have it, Exodus, Deuteronomy, you are making a mistake because Yom Sheni only appears here. And what the masteries are doing are tagging this phrase and saying it appears here and nowhere else. Don't make this mistake. 
Now let's move to the other end of the spectrum. Not things that appear once, but let's look at some things that appear many, many times. Let's look in Genesis 18.3 where Abraham says, Adonai my lords. And so there's a little circellus which tells you that this word has a note. We go into the margin and we see the letters kuf lamed dalid, and in Hebrew letters stand for numbers, so that kuf means 100, lamed means 30, and dalid means 4. So what the mass reads are telling you is that this word appears 134 times. And if you're scratching your head and saying, wait, this appears way more than 134 times, you're right. What the mass reads actually mean is that this appears 134 times without the name of God following it. So it's my Lord or my Lords without the name of God. And if you really want to find these verses, you look them up in the Mesorah Gedola, which we'll speak about in just a moment. Now, in addition to just counting words for quality control, the Masoretes also had some very interesting insights into the text itself. For example, if we look at Exodus 16.16, 16, we see that there's a circellus at the very beginning of the verse, and that tells us there's a Masoretic note in the Mesorah Katana. We look at the Mesorah Katana, and it says, Chaf Vav Sukin De'it Bahon Aleph Bet. There are 26 verses that have the Aleph Bet, the alphabet. And so what that means is that this verse has every single letter in the alphabet in it, and there are 25 others in the entire Bible that have this unique status. And actually, when we teach Biblical Hebrew at Biblical culture.org on the very first lesson when we do the alphabet we actually read these verses together because if you could read Exodus 16:16 16, 16, you know every single letter of the Hebrew alphabet now what I want to do is move to what is probably one of the most interesting pages in the entire Bible for the Mass Reads and that's page 1323 in the BHS a really fascinating page and in order to understand why this is so fascinating, we need to look at a concept called Ktiv Ukri, or sometimes pronounced Kri Uktiv. And that means that there's a difference in the Masoretic world between what's written on the page and what is read on the page. And the best way to demonstrate this is by actually looking at the cases themselves. So on page 1323 in the BHS, we actually have five cases of Kri Uktiv in the red boxes and two cases of super rare creative in the blue boxes. And we'll first take a look at one of the red, and then we'll look at each of the two blue boxes individually. So let's take a look at the red. Let's see what a creative is. In Ruth 3, verse 3, Naomi says to Ruth, via Radati, and I will go down. I will go down, but this doesn't make any sense because Naomi is telling Ruth to go down. Ruth should go down to Boaz and lie with him that night. So why does it say, and I will go down? So the Masoretes have a note on the side that this should be read via Radit. You will go down. So that Ruth is the one who is going down and not Naomi. And what this basically means is that there's a difference between what is read and what is written. And when we look at the translations for this verse, and I have four examples for you here, each and every one of the translators are going to follow what is read as opposed to what is written. And we see here they all say, and go down, Ruth, and go down, Ruth, and go down, Ruth, and go down, Ruth, meaning the Cree, the reading, is what is preserved in the English translation. All of these translations actually go against what is written in the biblical text itself. So these are creatives. These are cases where what is read is separate and different from what is written. But now let's take a look at these two super rare cases. And we're looking here at the end of Ruth 3, verse 5. And you'll notice here something very odd. There are vowels, vowel markers, but there are no consonants. And this makes no sense. Hebrew needs consonants just like almost every other language. You need a consonant. You can't just have vowels. This makes no sense. So what's going on? So notice there's a little circellus, and what it tells you to look is at the side. And the first word is a lie. And that means that this word, a lie, is what's supposed to be read. And then they say, chad min yud kri velokhtiv. This is one of ten occurrences in the Hebrew Bible where you have something read, but it's not written in the text. And this is mind-blowing that you can have a word in the Bible that isn't in the Bible itself. This is not in the Bible, but it's part of the Bible itself. The second example is just the opposite. It has the consonants here, aleph, mem, but it does not have the vowels. So I don't know how to pronounce this. Is this im? Is this am? Is this aim? Is it something else? And so what I do is I look at the side and it says im, this word, is chad min chet ktiv below kri. This is one of eight cases where we have a word that is written, but you do not read it. 
So there's something in the Bible that you are not supposed to read. And in fact, this word, Aleph Mem, actually messes up the meaning of the whole passage. Because instead of making something positive, it actually makes it negative, which doesn't make sense in the context. So this word is not meant to be read, and the masteries preserve that tradition. And this brings us to the Mesora Gadola, the large Mesora, in Latin, the Mesora Magna, M.M. for short. In the Leningrad Codex, the Mesora Gadola was at the top and bottom of the page, but in the BHS, it's in one paragraph just below the biblical text. And the way you get to the Mesora Gadola is through the Mesora Katana. So let's look at two examples that we just studied, those super rare creatives, the one that didn't have the word a lie, and the one that had the word im without vowels. And if we actually look at these notes, we see that there were small superscript numbers, in this case 5, and in the other case 13, and that tells us to go down and look at the Mesora Gadola. And what we see at number 5 and 13 are to look at the Mesora Magna MM2745 and the Mesora Magna 2752. And this is going to bring us to another book called the Mesora Gadola by Weil. And this book actually is part of the BHS. Most people don't know this, but the Bibli Rekish Tukartensia actually is two volumes, and this is volume number two, and this is the Mesora Gadola. And what this book is going to do is going to tell you all the numbers and the cases that the masteries are pointing you to. It's going to tell you all those verses. For number 2745, we're going to get our note. Yud Krivalov. There are 10 cases where you read something and it's not written. And these are the 10 cases in the Mesora Gadola. And notice our case is the second from the last, Ruth 3.5. Ruth 3.5, that was our case. And if we look at the other note, which was note 2752, there are chet ktiv velo kri. There are eight cases where you have words, but you don't read anything. And these are the eight cases in the Bible. And our case, Ruth 312, is at the very end. So what you see here is that the Masoretes and the Biblia Hebraica Shukartensia are telling you where each of these cases can be found. And this brings us to the Mesora Sofit, the Mesora Finalis, the final Mesora, and this is going to appear at the end of biblical books. And here we're looking at the Leningrad Codex at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, which is the end of the Torah, and we see a great deal of Masoretic activity. And what the Masters are going to do here is tell you numbers about the whole book or even about the whole Torah itself. So let's take a look in the BHS. Here we see Sikum Apsukim Shul Sefer, that the sum of the verses in the book are Tesha Mayot, 900, and 55. So there are nine. 155 verses in the book of Deuteronomy, and then they have the letters Hey, Nun, Sadi, Sofit, which if you recall, that letters in Hebrew can actually mean numbers, so this is the number 955. And then finally, we have one of my favorite Masoretic notes, and there are two reasons for this. So let's read it, and then I'll tell you the two reasons. It says, Sikum HaOtiot Shel Torah, the sum of the letters in the Torah are Arba Meot Elef, 400,000, Vitesha Meot, 900, Varba Im Vachamisha, and 45. So what the the streets are doing here are telling you that there are 400,945 letters in the Torah. If you have a Torah with one more or one less, you have made a grave mistake. You need to get in line. Keep with the tradition. You have 400,945. And that's a beautiful idea, and that's the first reason I love this note, that these people would actually count all these letters. The second reason I love this note is because there's an asterisk. This number is actually off by about 100,000. The actual Torah scroll has 304,805 letters in it. And this begs the question, how did this happen? How were the mass reads so far off? Were they counting differently? Did they have different traditions? And so this opens one up to the world of Masoretic studies, and it's a great world with many different books and many different avenues to study, but that's not for us right here, right now. So that's it. We were able to accomplish a great deal today. We began with the idea of textual instability, that scribes are imperfect, and mistakes can creep in, like where was Joshua buried? Was it Timnat Cheres or was it Timnat Serach? Those are two different words. And then this led us to the Masoretes, who were all about textual stabilization and quality control, and they tried to count every phrase and every word and make sure that everything appeared where it should. And then we looked at three types of Masoretic notes in the BHS. The first one was the Masoretic Katana, the small notes on the side. The second one was Masora Gadola, the large notes at the bottom. And then the third one was the Masora Sofit, the final Masora at the end of different books. And we also spoke about two important books you'll need in order to understand these Masoretic notes. And if you saw part one of this video, you learned how to use the scholarly apparatus. And what that means is that you now know 
everything on the page in the Biblia Hebraica Cartensia. Even if you don't want to study the Missouri notes, you know what they are and you know where they're leading you. And even if you don't want to study the scholarly apparatus, you know exactly what it is and what it's trying to do. And you also know that the biblical Hebrew text actually comes from somewhere. It came from the Leningrad Codex and the vowels did too, and so did the cancellation marks. And that's it for the BHS. I definitely love using the BHS. I love the Missouri notes. I love the scholarly apparatus. I think this is such a fantastic work. And stay tuned because the people who put out this book, the Deutsche Bibel Gesellschaft, are actually in the midst of putting out a new set of Bibles called Kinta, the fifth edition. And I'll have a video about that coming in the future. But until then, enjoy the BHS, and I hope to see you soon. If you enjoy this type of study, come join me and other great professors at biblicalculture.org where you can study the Bible and its cultural world.